who can send us comments through the chat feature. In there, you have the opportunity to choose whether to send those comments to all attendees and panelists or just to panelists. There's also a Q&A feature where you can send us your questions. Um, for those of us, those of you joining us live via YouTube this morning, please feel free to send us comments in the comment section, questions there as well. Uh, I am joined today by my, with my colleague, uh, Cassandra Abel, our community engagement manager. She will be monitoring chat Q&A and the YouTube comments. So if I miss something, she'll keep me on my toes and make sure I get everybody's comments um, acknowledged. So good morning and welcome. My name is Brittany Bevel. I'm the education curator at the Tampa Museum of Art. And it is my pleasure today to present you with a very special tour in partnership with the Gasparilla Festival of the Arts. The Gasparilla Festival of the Arts takes place the first weekend of March every year. And this year, as with everything else, they are all virtual. So we are so excited to be able to present this tour. I would like to remind everybody that the museum is offering free admission this weekend, March 6th and 7th. If you want to come visit open from 10 to five, both today and tomorrow. So please, after this, just a little taste after. So sorry, my headphones just disconnected and reconnected. Um, after this little taste of our exhibitions on view in our permanent collection, we do encourage you to come to the museum and experience the artwork for yourself. Our plan today is to look at a couple works of art in three of our current exhibitions that focus on the permanent collection here at the Tampa Museum of Art. So this year, last year and this year, we are celebrating the Tampa Museum of Art's 100th anniversary. We can trace our roots back to 1920. And with that celebration, we are presenting exhibitions from our permanent collection. So today we are gonna start by looking at an exhibition of women photographers. And we are going to begin with a dear friend of both the museum and the Gasparilla Festival of the Arts. Suzanne Camp Crosby, who created the three photographs you see here, and I will get closer to them in just a moment. Uh, Suzanne Camp Crosby was a longtime board member with Gasparilla Festival of the Arts, as well as a docent and a member of the collections committee here at the Tampa Museum of Art. In addition to all of the amazing volunteer work she did in our community, Suzanne was an artist and an educator. She was a photo laureate for the city of Tampa. Um, she was the, a professor at HCC teaching art and photography. I believe for some period of time, she actually held the role of head of the art department at HCC. And we were very sad to hear of her passing last December, but are very excited for this opportunity to have her artwork on view. As a photographer, Suzanne created these tableau settings. They're a bit surreal, a bit fantastic, and give the viewer an opportunity to step into a scene that they might not be able to experience in the real world. So here you have a piece titled Scenic View. Um, scenic View number one, sorry, Scenic View, and it features what appear to be cutouts of dinosaurs and a woman standing in an idyllic nature setting with a little hint of a volcano happening on that mountaintop. This piece by Suzanne, and I forgive me, you will have to come see these in person because thanks to the glare, you can probably see my reflection in the frames of works of Art on paper, photographs included, tend to be very light sensitive. So we take a lot of care to make sure they're as protected as possible. Um, this piece is titled Dinosaur Dreams and features a young figure in bed looking up at all of these wonderful dinosaurs and planetary scenes happening above his head, his or her head. And the final work we have on view by Suzanne is titled The Web. And as you look here, you do see a web built into the corner of a structure 
there are insects that appear to be not live insects, but rather added objects. So again, building this tableau scene with found objects. I should also mention that we are currently standing in the exhibition titled Her World in Focus, Women Photographers from the Permanent Collection. This exhibition looks at exactly as the title suggests, <laughs> women photographers from our permanent collection. There are artists who are creating tableau scenes such as Suzanne and this next one we're gonna look at, Maria Freiberg, as well as other artists like Bernice Abbott and um, a few others doing more abstract works with photography. So this piece by Maria Freiberg is actually quite large for a photograph. I'll step back to give you a sense of it on the wall. And it features four men floating in a pool. They are dressed to the nines in their suits, um, but they appear a little dazed um, and a little bit lost in the expressions on their face. This, this photograph is mounted on a piece of glass. So in addition to you know, the other works having some reflective nature due to their frames, this one is a little bit um, reflective because it is a glass piece. Maria Freiberg explores ideas of identity and masculinity in her work. And here she's addressing men in turmoil. So this, the differences between the way they're dressed and the kind of serene and calm nature of the pool are really pointing to some themes of identity Maria Freiberg created this piece titled Almost There, number two in the year 2000. And so 21 years later, this work still, I think, can resonate with some of our audiences today as they think about what it means in the contemporary climate. So we are going to move away from the women photographers and step into the exhibition Figure Forward works from the permanent collection, selections from the permanent collection, excuse me. And this exhibition is divided into two galleries. The one we're currently standing in focuses on the um, portrait. So images of muses, of alter egos, and some self portraits. This is one that always never ceases to surprise when I give tours. Um, this is Egel Ozari's Philippa from 2015. And this is an oil painting on paper. So again, because it's on paper, it is behind glass. But it really is a remarkable example of photorealism in painting. Next to Egal Azari's piece is a work by Alex Katz. This is Bathing Cap Ada. <laughs> Excuse me. And Bathing Cap Ada um, is one of Katz's portraits of his wife, Ada. Ada serves out, continues to serve as a muse for Katz. Their relationship is longstanding. Um, if I remember correctly, dates back to the 50s. And they are... Um, still quite in love. When we had our Alex Katz exhibition quite a couple of years ago, Katz and Ada came to the opening and it was really great to see the muse in person because she does appear in so many of his artworks. This work of art is a print and it's a silk screen that has 35 different colors, which means that in order to create it, they had to have 35 different screens. And if you think of silk screening as that technique that is used to get images on your t-shirt, um, that's the closest I can describe it in uh, this moment without other visual aids to assist. Standing in front of the Katz and the Ozari piece is a work by Mexican-born artist Pepe Mar, who currently resides in uh, Miami. And this is a work titled Burning Up. It's about four feet tall to give you a sense of scale. 
And Burning Up was originally created in 2006. However, when the museum acquired this piece in 2019, the artist did make some adjustments. And so um, if you were to come to the museum and saw the label, you'll see that the date on it is 2006 slash 19. And Pepe Mar, um, when talking about his work, he uses found objects. So this really fantastic paper head piece, if you uh, interpret this sculpture as a human figure, uh, is all made out of found paper, found designs. And you have other found objects making up the sculpture itself. Pepe Mar has said of his work that all of his pieces ultimately end up featuring or being a example of his alter ego. His alter ego's name is Paprika, and Paprika is a figure without gender, without ethnicity, without race. The, it is a figure that represents equality for all, and so this alter ego is an ideation of Pepe Mar's ideals and the world that he hopes we will one day live in. We are going to move into the other gallery related to this exhibition. And this is the gallery that focuses in on the human body. So whereas the one we're leaving is more about the face, the portrait, and the individual, this one is a little bit more um, focused on the body as well as the absence of the body. And one piece that is a museum fan favorite or staff favorite is this work by Mernette Larson. This is Mernette Larson's The Raft from 2017. And the museum acquired this piece in 2019, um, in, or, uh, excuse me, 2018. In 2017, we had an exhibition of Mernette's work titled Getting Measured. And this is one of the newer pieces in that exhibition. Mernette Larson, in her work, uses a technique titled uh, or called reverse perspective. So normally when we think about objects in space, they get smaller as they recede into the background and larger as they come into the foreground. But you can see with this raft that the figure is standing on, the opposite is happening. So it is smaller in the foreground larger in the background. The figures themselves are one in the foreground. Fishing here is quite large compared to the figure in the background on this little floaty. Burnett's style is also very recognizable for these geometric figures, taking typically organic shapes like clouds and giving them these very hard edges. She also plays with proportions and size as can be seen in this figure's very, very long legs. <laughs> so in addition to modern and contemporary art, as we've explored so far, the Tampa Museum of Art also collects Greek and Roman art. There are eight different areas within our collecting practice. Um, Within the antiquities, we have objects related to antiquities like 19th century photography um, and some prints, as well as a series of 20th century sculptures, early 20th century sculptures, um, with, sorry, 19th century and 20th century cultures, sculptures in the neoclassical vein inspired by the antiquities. But oftentimes the star of the show is our classical antiquities collection. So in these galleries, you will find objects from ancient Greece, Rome, Etraria, and Egypt. This first room, titled The Classical World, features a general overview of the uh, era that we're covering, or eras, there's quite a few of them, as well as general overview of the objects we collect. You are currently looking at our statue of Poseidon, or Neptune. This is a Roman marble copy of an original Greek bronze. So depending on how you choose to read it at the moment, 
If you're studying it for the Roman copying practices, this would be Neptune. If you are thinking back to the original Greek bronze it was modeled after, this would be Poseidon. And we know this from a couple of different things. The first clue that is most helpful is the little friendly figure that is helping Poseidon stand. And this is an object that, um, or a figure that we have identified as a dolphin. So his nose is down here at the bottom and his tail attaches to Poseidon's hip here. In addition to the dolphin, there is on the base here, a small hole. We see a similar hole on Poseidon's hip, as well as one on his shoulder. And those are likely the attachment points for the trident he would have carried that also would have helped us identify him as Poseidon or Neptune. The final clue that helps us figure this out is the face itself. So this bearded man, um, typically when we see sculptures in this vein, we can guess that they are of gods. And there's three gods in particular that get represented with the full beard. Zeus, king of the gods, lightning bolts and eagles are symbols associated with him. Hades, god of the underworld, who many artists did not actually depict. Um, one theory for this is that they did not want to draw attention to themselves by, de by depicting images of the god of the underworld. And then the third being Poseidon, um, god of the sea. And so thanks to our dolphin-like creature and the attachment points where his trident would have been, we have interpreted this as Poseidon. As with many sculptures from this era, there are things missing. He does not have his hands. It is a marble sculpture at some point in time. It likely broke. Um, but also, if you look at the back side of the sculpture, you'll notice a kind of empty spot on the back of his head. These sculptures often were adorned with metal objects that helped identify and add the splendor of the sculpture. Um, so likely he had a metal crown at some point in time that was removed and repurposed as metal can be melted down and reused and so often does not survive from antiquity. I will show you a couple objects that go counter to that argument, um, but we will move into the galleries a little bit. So this next object I'm gonna show you, unfortunately is a little hard to see because it's backlit by our window to our beautiful Brenna B. Sullivan Terrace, um, but it's a cloudy day. So it's showing up a little bit better than it usually does. This little marble storage vessel is the oldest object in our collection. It's dated to the years um, 3000 to 2800 BC. And it is from the Cicla early Cycladic cultures. Um, and we don't have a whole lot of information about it. We have visual clues that help us figure out what it might have been used for. And so these tiny holes you can see around the edges, there's four of them. Those give us a hint that at some point in time, this probably had a lid and string or twine or rope would have been threaded through those tiny holes to help tie the lid down. Keep in mind, this is before the era of interlocking Tupperware. So um, a storage jar, we do display it on its side as the foot is a little small. So just for the safety of the object, we wanna make sure it's 100% secure. But that gives us an opportunity to look inside where we don't often get to do that with a lot of the objects in the Greek and Roman collection. They either have lids like this cinerary urn from Villanova, or they're just quite large like this beautiful impasto amphora from the Etruscan cultures um, that again, hard to see with some of the reflections, but there's really wonderful imagery of boats and shells and sea creatures. Um, so really worth a close look when you come visit the museum. Our collection features highlights from a lot of different time periods. Um, the geometric and archaic and leading into the um, classical and Hellenistic periods, but we really are quite strong in 
black figure and red figure vases. Just checking my time because I can talk about this forever. So I want to make sure I don't go too far over the half hour time limit that I was going to spend with our objects. Um, and so our ceramic collection really gives a great opportunity to see the similarities and differences between cultures, the interconnectedness of the ancient world. So here you have a Greek amphora, um, there's figures in that top register. This bottom one has uh, sirens in it on this side. I believe there's a, a sphinx on the top register up here. And it's very similar in style to this piece that's a little bit duller in color. Um, and this piece was an Etruscan piece. We don't know if the Etruscan piece was made first and the Greeks were copying it or vice versa, but the similarity in imagery and the attempt at using the Etruscan clay that doesn't have that bright, vibrant orange that the clay found in the area around Athens has tells us that there was a lot of conversations happening between two cultures. Now, the Etruscans were quite amazing at doing Bucaro pottery. So you have these really beautiful black shiny pieces. Again, it's going to be really hard for me to show you all the details in the gallery with my reflection in the way, but definitely a good excuse to come visit us. In addition to that Bucaro pottery, the Etruscans were quite well versed in creating bronze pieces. So we have a number of bronze um, objects from the Etruscan period including some heroes and gods. Uh, so standing on the left here with his arm stretched out towards us is um, Heracle, the Etruscan version of Hercules. Um, he is holding three apples in his hand. You see the lion skin hood tied around his head, which helps us identify him. Um, so this is likely related to his final labor where he or one of his labors where he retrieved the apples of Hesperides. Next to him, we have a figure um, with a garment draped around his waist and his upraised arm. Um, he's holding a small deer in his hand. This is likely Aplu, the Etruscan version of Apollo. And then one of my favorite pieces um, that's currently on view is this makeup case. And I love that we, our exhibition team took the opportunity to display it open. So you can see that some of these objects are a little surprise to them. This lid, when fitted on this base, actually makes it look like a water jar um, rather than a box or a pixis. And so once you take the lid off, you see that it becomes a box and it has three compartments on the inside. We have two of the lids separated from the um, compartment itself. So you can see this one has the head of potentially a woman. The one on that tall pedestal in the back features a actor. And then there's another one that is currently on the box that could be the head of a man. Um, but our theory with the imagery that's on the front here where we see a young man preparing, getting dressed. However, his hair is very much in the style of a woman. We think this might be an actor's makeup kit. And there's a long tradition in throughout history of men taking on women's roles in the theater. So for our final couple of minutes before I see if there's any questions, I'm gonna tease this exhibition. I'm not gonna dive into it too deeply um, because Tomorrow at 1 p.m., I will be giving another tour where we take a look at her story, Stories of Ancient Heroines and Everyday Women. Monday is International Women's Day, and this exhibition was curated by myself and Cassandra Abel, who's on this call, um, as an opportunity to look at the role that women played in classical antiquity. Um, last year, the 2020, was the 100th anniversary of the ratification of the 19th Amendment and women's right to vote. And so we really were excited by this opportunity to look at the stories that we have featured in our objects that help tell the story of women in classical antiquity, as well as 
women today. So join me tomorrow again via Zoom webinar or um, via the T Tampa Museum of Art YouTube channel at 1 p.m. live. Otherwise, it'll be archived on the museum's um, YouTube channel to go back to. And we'll do a deeper dive into women in the ancient world. So with that, I am going to open it up to questions. Um, for those of you joining us via Zoom, I will ask Cassandra to pop the link to the um, video for tomorrow into the chat, if that's easily accessible for her. But I am here to answer questions about any of our exhibitions um, or the objects that we looked at today. I should also note that when you come visit, there are two exhibitions we did not get a chance to look at. They fall outside of the permanent collection that we were exploring today. And those are um, Living Color, the Art of the Highwaymen, and the 14th Congressional and Next Generation High School Art Competition. Ooh. Great question, Jose. Um, I got a question. Any idea what percentage of works in the collection were done by women? No, <laughs> is the easy answer. The uh, longer answer is the museum has embarked, especially since the hiring of our current curator, um, Joanna Robotham, curator of modern and contemporary art, in making sure that women are adequately represented in our collection. So since Joanna joined the team in 2016, we have acquired multiple works of art by women artists, including the Murnett Larson that we looked at, um, and Patricia Cronin's Aphrodite Reimagined, this large 10 foot tall sculpture in her story, um, as well as pieces by other artists, um, like Francine Tint um, was one of the early pieces Joanna wanted to acquire for the museum. And so we are really um, looking to and working on embarking on making sure our collection features more women artists. Um, but I do not know the exact percentage. Awesome, those of you who are joining us via uh, Zoom just got the link to join us tomorrow if you want to learn more about the Horstory exhibition. And we will continue to offer online programs through the museum. You can always find that information on our website, tampamuseum.org. If you click on events at the top there, you'll get our events calendar that has the most up-to-date information Regarding what's upcoming, we have a number of virtual studio art making opportunities as well as lectures and tours um, and other programs in various formats. So please check that out and come visit the museum. I'll reiterate in honor of our partnership with the Gasparilla Festival of the Arts, we are offering free admission this weekend, March 6th and 7th. So please come down, visit the galleries. And we look forward to seeing you at the museum sometime soon or in a future virtual program. Have a wonderful weekend, everybody, and enjoy shopping on the Gasparilla Festival of the Arts website for some new artwork.